like to call the meeting to order and the way to start our meetings t this time of year is uh, with the Pledge of Allegiance. So we're going to move the guys to the school and cut off, etc. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, a Madrid, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Yep. <laughs> so today is a very oh, special day. We uh, presented the Boston Post came to the Gates Richards uh, several months ago, uh, recognizing her as the oldest citizen of Jackson. And Louise loved us so much she moved out of town. <laughs> and, uh, honestly, she moved away to be closer to family. So we are going to present the Boston Post came today to Warren Shoemaker. And um, if you don't know Warren, please get to know him today or sometime at the Historical Society. Um, he is quite an amazing man. Um, and, and Warren, I'm going to read a letter, and then Anne Gilliam, the new representative from the Historical Society, is going to read a bio about Warren. So, Dear Mr. Shoemaker, on behalf of the Town of Jackson and the Jackson Historical Society, it gives us great pleasure to present you with the Boston Post Cane in recognition, honor, and respect to you as our oldest citizen of Jackson. Awarding the Boston Post Cane is a tradition that began in 1909 throughout New England, and we are proud to still have the Town of Jackson's original 14 karat gold topped ebony cane. Throughout history, Canes were considered a sign of leadership and an ancient symbol of deference to age and reverence of ancestors. The enclosed certificate has been prepared for you as a symbolic representation as the honored recipient of the Boston Post Cane. A brass nameplate with your name will be affixed to the case displaying Jackson's original cane located in the town office's building, which is actually in the corner there. So, I'm oh, sorry, let me forget this. Thing here. So Warren, at this time, I would like to present the original Boston Post cane to you. And we've managed to keep that in excellent condition in the building here. And this certificate, which makes you the oldest recipient of the oldest resident. Say that? Could we have more yes, I was going to say, for a um, some pictures of if we could just have you drop your mask down, and I'll stand back a little here, and then face the cameras over up there. Thank you. Take it all the way off, right? There you go. Hi. All right. And so the original cane will stay in the building here, and you will have a replica cane. And Anne, would you uh, please present the bio of Mr. Shoemaker here? You can hold that for the duration of the ceremony. Oh, that's he's going to have to go in there. Um, welcome, everyone, and thanks for coming to honor Warren. Um, Warren Schumacher, aged 97 years old, was born in Sydney, Australia in 1924. Warren came to America in 1945 and secured his first job with a maker of telephone equipment in Rochester, New York. While in Rochester, Warren and a partner formed Utility Services to acquire its first small telephone company in Melbourne Village, New Hampshire. By 1964, and after many acquisitions throughout the world, the companies were folded in to Continental Telephone Corporation, later renamed Contel, and went public. In 1996, Warren and Leslie moved from Kennebunkport, Maine, to Jackson, New Hampshire. Having been president of the Kennebunkport Historical Society, Warren joined the Jackson Historical Society. Under his leadership, with the help of many, accomplishments of the society have been numerous. Some highlights to include. Listing 17 historic buildings within Jackson Village to the National Register of Historic Places. 
staging a year-long Town of Jackson Bicentennial celebration, helping the grammar school kids create a time capsule due to open in 2026, erecting the Korean War Monument, creating the memorial walk right outside here to the town offices, <clears throat> restoring the old snow roller, which is across from the society in front of the Wentworth Inn, funding the paving of the town hall before the society was using it, <clears throat> and purchasing the chairs, which are now at the Whitney Center. Restoring the town hall, new roof, second floor egress, new siding, new wiring, and general renovations. Publishing numerous books of historic interest, which several are for sale in the Historical Society. <laughs> um, establishing 19th century White Mountain art as a focus of the society and creating the Museum of White Mountain Art up on the second floor of the Society building. Commissioning a replica of the town's Boston Post cane and having a case made for the original one and this to be stored when necessary in the over here. Warren had resurrected this tradition back in the 90s and had this replica made and the case made and uh, fast forward here we are celebrating. <laughs> Born as a new recipient. Um, saving the timbers of the historic Tricky Barn, which was scheduled to be demolished and stored them for a future use. The timbers were later donated to the town for construction of the new public library right outside here. And the society helped raise funds to construct the building. The beautiful new library is a wonderful example of the Jackson Historical Society teaming with the town of Jackson and the community at large. Finished with Warren Schumacher through both his extraordinary vision and getting it done abilities is a shining example of how one person can make far reaching and long lasting positive impacts in a community. We thank Warren for his years of tireless work, generous support, valuable expertise, entrepreneurial leadership, and unsurpassed dedication on behalf of the society and the town of Jackson. We are very pleased to honor Warren Schumacher as our Boston Post Cane recipient. summer morning, a Saturday morning, when they, uh, Leslie and I had worked through a very bad winter, saving the, the timbers so they didn't get wet. We rented big trailers to store them in. And uh, so the, uh, all of the things had been, all of the, well, all the requirements had been put in line, starting with the selectmen who had uh, 
done, cleared all the legal work required for the town to accept uh, uh, not only the timbers for the library, but also to accept money. And, uh, and not only from us, but then from the whole community. And uh, they, um, to this, well, it was just great to see the selectmen uh, voting three to zero to support the uh, to support the creation of the library, as well as uh, uh, allocating and having a warrant article and approving all of the funds that the were required from from the town for the library. So that all the pieces were in, in place when that was done. And then the whole community jumped in and uh, it was, I think, one of the best examples of community effort, working together. And uh, the, I told people at the time that uh, how wonderful it was that we actually had a trifecta that there are people that love libraries, people that love history, and people that love barns. And boy, that's a win now. Yeah. Yeah. And, uh, and it won very, very well. And you, the evidence is right out here to see. And, um, but that day I started to say about a Saturday morning, a beautiful sunny day, uh, and all the timbers had been laid out on saw horses outside all over the field here uh, to be cleaned. And he said, it was most of the women jumped to, uh, to, to go clean these timbers with some special solution with brushes and kids are running back to get more solution because they were working so hard they used it up so quickly. And um, so it was, uh, you know, such a sight that all these people spread out over that field there. And boy, you talk about evidence of community working together. It was a wonderful, wonderful demonstration. And that's something I'm always going to remember. And uh, even, uh, and I'm going to remember it for a long time. <laughs> well, it's beautiful. and if. I, I want to go back in now just to revisit the book of, photog of photographs that, that are in the library to see when it was built and how it came to be. So yeah. thank you so yeah. much for all of your contributions to the town. All right, well, thank you. Thanks, Warren. All right, can right, we go now? <laughs> <laughs> from the previous meeting, there is one correction, just that Peter Fraser's name was um, omitted from the attendees at the meeting, so uh, we will add that as a correction to those minutes. Did you have any other questions on the minutes? I will take a motion to approve those. Make a motion to approve last week's minutes. I will second. Yes. All in favor? Aye. Okay. We, um, while you're signing, we also had a um, non-public meeting, uh, according to RSA 91-A, colon 3, 2, C, and we um, are going to, I'll take a motion to keep these minutes sealed. Okay, make a motion to keep those minutes sealed. And I will second. All in favor? Aye. Okay, is 
And the second non-public session we had was based on um, a legal issue that we had talked about with consolidated communications and a settlement agreement. We agreed to um, issue the settlement in the amount of $1,257, and hopefully it will go away forever. And, um, recommended by our attorney. Recommended by our attorney to, to accept this as a settlement. So um, I will take a motion to leave these minutes unsealed and to issue the $1,257. I will make that motion. I will second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Okay. Include those and in the... Uh, do, I think yeah. we have to include these in our minutes for this meeting, correct? Next meeting. Yeah. yeah. Okay. All right. That is the approval of minutes. Now to the meat of the, the uh, meeting here. Um, I'm going to read a, uh, this is uh, regarding a driveway permit submitted by Frank um, Benish, and this has been, Frank and Martha Benish, and this has been going on for about a year now. Um, so the issue really is whether or not the Benishes have the uh, right to build a driveway on an easement that they were granted. And so there are many lawyers involved, including our attorney, the attorney for folks that live in the development and the attorney for the benishes. Um, so we've been going back and forth with attorney letters and decided not to have the attorneys here, but Peter Melia wrote this um, information for us to consider that Mr. and Mrs. Benish's attorney wrote us a letter back on June 22nd, 2021, which Peter suggested resolved the dispute in favor of the Benishes. When I read the information that he provided to us though, which says that there has been a great deal of information provided to the town in writing from the abutters, from the lawyer for the abutters, and most recently from the lawyer representing the Benishes, uh, this application satisfies the requirements for a driveway permit in the town of Jackson relieving us from what I guess it says that he's met all the requirements for filling out the driveway application but it does not mean that he can necessarily build the driveway because it has to approve be approved with the um, the burden of proof from the association that he can build there what I'm basically rambling on about is that I still think we need to hear from the attorneys directly and talk to Peter on why he's recommending that now we accept this driveway permit. Um, John and Frank, do you have any other comments? Well, all I've been hearing about the common land and the fact that you 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 know it's, it goes against our zoning ordinance if you're going to use that for a driveway, and that it shouldn't be permitted. Okay, um, or find another way to get a driveway to get out of there because Mr. Benish is having trouble going right onto 60 Route 16. You want some an easier way to get out of Route 16 and traffic and all that. But our attorney is saying, grant them, but ultimately it's going to be the association that's going to decide. So I think what Barbara just said is that maybe we should talk to our attorneys personally first before we make that first step. Um, and that, I think, so I agree with that idea of meeting with our attorneys. Okay. And I don't think we should go ahead with this right yet. Thoughts, John? Um, yeah, you know, they're asking for just the approval of the application, but not actually the building of the driveway at this point because of the onus would be on um, the benches and, yeah, and, and that common land issue. Um, I, I would like to see it a little clearer from Peter than what's written here um, at this moment. So um, I personally, you know, it, you know, this is something I think that we should you know, investigate a little bit more. So we will not be making a motion today. We will consider um, talking to the attorneys again and to be continued. And I you want to hopefully we can get this resolved. So ask. since they're here. Any issues with So um Hi. Hi. Is there an opportunity for questions? 
Yes, hold on one second. Okay. I just want to one um, thing. Pat, Kelly, there's a note that Peter mentioned that you added a condition to your approval of the driving, per driving permit, which the applicant needed to comply with. What was that? Um, do you recall what that condition was? I don't have any idea. Okay. I don't remember. We'll cover that again. Too. I remember looking at it, and I don't remember seeing anything. I mean, take all the legality side stuff out of it. I don't remember anything saying uh, he couldn't. You know, it fell within the guidelines of town specs and stuff. So, sight distance and, and the things that I want. No issue on your end. No, I don't remember anything that was put in there. I'd have to look at the copy, the copy of the driveway permit, but I don't um, remember any. You know, I'm, I'm looking back here a little bit. It says you signed and specified what is needed for a culvert. So the driveway can be put into town spec with no issues. Um, so I guess it has to be that the, the, it's brought to standards for the culvert. But um, again, I think we just need to clarify all the issues uh, with Peter and address it at the next meeting. And you are? Oh, I'm Clea Lukowitz, and I'm one of the abutters. Hi. Um, I just didn't know if there was this was an opportunity here for questions, um, or if it, this is going to be continued as you're suggesting. It is going to be continued. So I guess um, if you do have questions or other comments at this time, I think I'd rather have them submitted through your attorney, and we can address them all together. Okay. All right. That that's, fair? that's fine. Okay. What association were you talking about? Um, I say that with a, a oh. lowercase a. <laughs> okay. The, uh, All right. Are the abutters. I just have to address it as that. Oh, okay. Thanks. Does that make sense? Thank you. Okay. All right. That will be continued, and we will consult with lawyers. This letter was dated June 28, 2001. I need to take a drink of water before I leave this one. So, letter of agreement. 2020. 2021. Yeah. Oh, did I say something? I think it's 2001. 2021. Um, this is re a letter of agreement with the town of Jackson regarding the continued upkeep of the Iron Mountain Road. And this is addressed to the Jackson, New Hampshire Board of Selectmen. This letter is meant to capture the conversation had in an in-person meeting June 25th, 2021 at Hayes Farm between a few Iron Mountain property owners and Dick Bennett, former selectman of the town of Jackson. The Upper Saco Valley Land Trust was also represented. As a former town of Jackson selectman and now a private citizen, Mr. Bennett was willing to meet with the represented property owners to participate in a conversation and share information about the Iron Mountain Mountain Road care and upkeep. He was asked to help the owners better understand how best to approach the town with suggestions of how they could work with the town to facilitate a solution to the needed road care and upkeep. The focus of the meeting was on how to continue the long time maintenance of the Iron Mountain Road in order to make it possible for emergency vehicles, property owners, hikers and visitors to safely travel on the road over its entire length during the spring, summer and fall in parentheses, April 1st through November 1st, in parentheses. As has historically been the case, the town has cared for the road to make it passable for all emergency vehicular traffic. This has been the standard of care for the last 33 years. For reference, we as property owners recently received a letter from the town dated April 9th, 2021, that asked us to waive many of the rights we had previously agreed on with the town through many years of working together. The property owners have always partnered with the town in the care of the road in a very cooperative relationship. The mailing came out of the blue and caught us off guard as it represented altering the already agreed on care long in place. 
None of the property owners signed this waiver as it did not reflect any previous established agreement. This change in direction from the town ultimately led to last week's meeting with Dick Bennett. For further reference, the following are reproductions from letters between Robin Willits and the town of Jackson. We have provided copies of the originals to the town on June 28, 2021. And this is quoting from the previous minutes. In 1987 and 1988, Robin Willits received notes from the Board of Selectmen stating the board's intention to maintain the Iron Mountain Road for passage of emergency vehicles, including our police cruiser. They were dated 9-21-1987 and 2-3-1988. At this time, the road was reclassified from a Class 5 to a Class 6 in order to waylay any development of further housing. On July, I'm sorry, on September 11th, 1987, Town Legal Counsel advised the Board of Selectmen with this language. It would be imprudent and illogical for the town to let the road go completely to pieces. It provides access for firefighting and for rescue of hikers and hunters. It's a long one. We have a copy of the minutes from the Selectman's meeting of August 20th, 2009. A motion was passed unanimously to designate portions of four roads as emergency lanes. They are Carter Notch on the Class 5 portion, Marsh Brook, Wildcat Brook, and Iron Mountain Road. In 1973, Iron Mountain Road was designated a scenic road. In our discussions with Mr. Bennett, we all focused on what we could do moving forward to assure safe passage on the road. It was clear to all the road had already deteriorated in the last two weeks and needed attention as soon as possible. We also discussed the gate that had been erected by the town and how we needed to agree on the continued use of such an impediment without interrupting spring, summer, and fall passage. We, as the owners, came to following understanding. Number one, we would create language that the town could sign off on that would capture the definitive agreement for ongoing care of the road. Number two, we agreed the two post barrier that now exists just past the forestry road would only have the bars in place, which would be reduced to a two by four from a two by six inch rail from November 1st to April 1st in order to stop vehicular traffic, including snow plows and unregistered winter machines like snowmobiles and ATVs from traveling the road. Property owners would be able to register their winter machines with the town to allow travel to their properties during the winter months. Mr. Bennett referenced other Jackson roads that have a similar designation for winter and signage that reflects the period of time that the road is closed to vehicular traffic. There was agreement at the meeting this would be a good addition to the Iron Mountain Road signage. Here is the suggested language for the ongoing Iron Mountain Road care agreement. The town of Jackson will maintain the Iron Mountain Road for passage of emergency use vehicles, including ambulances throughout the April 1st through November 1st timeframe. This maintenance care and upkeep upkeep should take place no later than Memorial Day and if needed also take place at whatever intervals necessary to keep the road in shape for the passage of these emergency vehicles. This language borrows from the long-standing agreement already in place and only looks to refocus the agreed-on course of action on the care and upkeep necessary to keep the road in safe condition during the non-winter passable months. There was also discussion about the U.S. Forest Service being engaged as a partner in the, dis in the continued care of the road and the conversation is being led by Jim Innes of U.S. Forest Service in direct conversations with the town. Thank you for your consideration, Iron Mountain property owners. And it is signed by Martin Schoonman, Patricia Schoonman, representing Iron Mountain property owners and representatives in attendance at the June 25th meeting at Hayes Farm were Dick Bennett, property owners Tom Willits, representing both Roy and Tom Willits, Pat and Marty Schoonman, Peter Frazier, representing Madeline Frazier Cook and Sophie <coughs> Frazier, uh, Upper Saco Valley Land Trust, Jeff Sires, and represented in post-conversation agreement, Susan and David Mason and Bruce and Jennifer Mello. Okay. Um, a couple things. Uh, there were some town owner, uh, property owners that did, I believe, sign the waiver last year. So, um, and this was discussed at many meetings. So I'm not sure why the mailing um, came out of the blue. 
and was caught on guard. <coughs> but that being said, um, this is a class six road, and I did some. I did some homework reading the book, A Hard Road to Travel. Um, so I got to learn a lot of things about Class 6 roads. Um, the town is not required to do any maintenance on a Class 6 road. However, um, as Frank read in the minutes of the last meeting, and Pat had provided some information, he does um, go up on Iron Mountain Road and um, do some of the grading up there to make it safer to travel on. If the town were to take on any other maintenance, especially scheduled maintenance, it could, it could jeopardize the road being a class six road and build, making it to a class five road. So um, we won't be changing that language based on what the suggestions were um, in the letter, although I appreciate the input that we've gotten from that. Um, one of the other things that was that was discussed at the meeting was the waiver that we did provide the property owners, um, which had the, um, I thought the right language that our attorney had provided that said that the owner agrees that at his or her expense, he or she shall be responsible for maintaining access to their property, the subject property, in a good and passable condition, which made the owners of the property responsible for the getting the access from the class six road to their property. And this also, um, we also had the information that um, registered those snow machines and other ATVs to have access to the property. Um, did you have any other comments or thoughts on this? Um. Based on I was I was going to ask Pat about getting up there in April. I don't know which is going to go through here, but just to, just I, off the top of my head, I wrote a note to myself that April I mean, probably is a little too soon to get up to do any maintenance. I don't right? think you can do anything up there with dates personally. That's my personal opinion. I'm sorry, you can do what? I don't think I don't think you should do anything up there with dates because it could snow in October, and when it snows, when the roads right. ice, we don't go. Right. Up. Yep. And I don't think anybody has any problems with that. Right. No. And and then we don't go up until the road is thought out because you put equipment up there and it's muddy, it's going to mm -hmm. make a giant mess. So, so dates, I think, are out of the question. I mean, mm -hmm. I, I would assume... Okay, I'm going to ask, the last meeting was a little bit um, unorganized, so I'm going to ask that please, if you're, if you're addressed to speak, that you speak. Otherwise, if everyone could just wait until we can ask for comment, I would appreciate it. Go ahead, Pat. So I, I mean, that's, that would be my recommendation, is, mm -hmm. is not putting dates on it. Um, I, there's a couple of things that are there. I don't believe, um, I don't believe that the select board, I'm not sure if you ever voted to make Iron Mountain Road the same as we did for Carter Notch Road and Black Mountain Road uh, a year or two ago when we decided to make them closed to travel. I'm not sure that the selectmen ever voted that in officially. But the same signage is at the bottom of the hill that says the road is, you know, is subject to winter uh, ordinances and to see to see the town of Jackson website for those specific ordinances. And so um, there is there are issues with um, with the document. I'm not sure why there are issues with the document um, for the waiver of. Um, the waiver and the registration of the snow machines, but that gives the owners access, uh, uh, gives the owners the ability to use snow machines to access their property. So, um, like I said, our attorney drew that up, and I feel like it's a, um, a, a good document to use for owners of the property on, on Iron Mountain Road. Any comments from you? No, the only thing you mentioned, that, you know, the fear of it going back to a class five, well, back in 2009, the selectmen went through the North Country Council and they found that you, we can do work up there without fear of it being reclassified as a class five. So it's okay for us to do work up there. What's work? When right. we so, <laughs> Paving it? No. 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 But I'll read the RSA 
231-59-A allows municipalities to spend highway funds to keep Class 6 highways passable <coughs> by firefighting equipment and rescue or other emergency vehicles, but only if selectmen, after public hearing, de declare the relevant road as an emergency lane. So um, I don't know if that was done in that past, but that is the only reason that we would be required to do maintenance there. Um, the other thing is, I'm not sure what signage is on Iron Mountain Road, but um, you, we talked about other hikers and other tourists and other folks going up the road and not being able to turn around or have an access point to turn around. And there are two recommended sign signs that could be put there unless they're already there that say unmaintained class six highway beyond this point, travel at your own risk. Signs can only do so much because people can choose to ignore them. But um, And then another one that would say town maintenance ends, ends 100 feet ahead or however many feet ahead. So if it may result in better signage to get less traffic up there that's unwanted traffic, then I think maybe, Pat, we can talk about that to see if there's any additional. Those are there. Those are there already? So okay. Classic so, town yeah. road. Okay. So, um, comment? Yeah, hi, I'm Jeff Sire hi, Jeff. with the Upper Sauk Valley Land Trust. Um, and just as a point of clarification, I, I do think that the letter submitted by Tom Willits did reference some, some past designation by the town of Iron Mountain Road as an emergency lane, which, as Frank noted, would allow for maintenance without reverting back to a class five road. Right. And I believe that the maintenance that's being done now is sufficient to make it passable like as an emergency lane. So I don't think that's in conflict with anything that's that's being done now. Mm -hmm. Martin Schoolman. Uh, Martin. 316 Iron Mountain Road. You can take your mask down. Oh. Thank you. <laughs> and I don't have my hearing aids, so I didn't <laughs> fall out this time. <laughs> but I, I just wanted to, to make a little lighter note here that I wanted to thank these guys for the work that they've done. Mm -hmm. uh, Jay came in after Hurricane Irene, mm -hmm. and in two days the road was passable. It looked like it was the, um, the Rocky Branch River. Was yeah. down on the lower section, and Pat has done a good job keeping it open. <clears throat> also, so uh, kudos to these guys. Thank you. I appreciate you recognizing that. Yes. My name is Peter Fraser. Hi, Peter. <laughs> Thank you for being at the last meeting and this meeting. Thank you. <laughs> uh, One eighty-two Iron Mountain Road. Uh, we bought this property up there in 1954. Mm -hmm. I've been going up there since I was eight years old, and I've seen that road in all kinds of different conditions. And But the last 20 or 25 years since the emergency lane designation and the scenic road and all of these other uh, very, very important touristy kinds of things, I, I, we must have had last Saturday 40 cars go up there. And it's, there's just an awful lot of use of that road. And I must say that I have to agree with Marty that in the last 25 or so years, we, or 30, uh, you know, we've been really just generally speaking very pleased with the way the road has been maintained at the level it's been maintained. And I just also wanted to say that my confusion with the letter sent out on April the 9th is it read as if we were to maintain the road from the gate and from where it came class six or where the forestry road, where the gate is now, um, that we were to maintain that. That's what the document says. And I, I hope that I can get some clarification, or we can get some clarification, that that's not what we're talking about. That are we talking about maintenance from where the Class 6 road begins to our particular residences? Or, or what are we talking about? 
So in any case, we really appreciate your consideration about these various issues because our concern here is spring, summer, and fall has nothing to do with anything else just to make sure that we have a designation as emergency lane and that the, the, the maintenance that's been done for the last 25, 30 years will continue to be done. Okay, so I appreciate that comment and I see you shaking your head too, Susan. So I will look back at the waiver once again I will talk to our attorney and see the way it's, it's um, drawn up and review it again. And we'll go back to some of the meetings that we had in the Zoom meetings as well. Yes. And um, and revisit some of the language. I, again, I don't think we're going to be putting specific dates in here, but but we'll um, we'll make sure that it is clarified. One second, please. Pat, did you have a comment? So I think the, potentially I can clear up some of that. I believe, and go if ahead. I can, so. In the RSA on the Class Six Road, I think this will clear it up. And I don't know, I don't know what the letter was. I didn't see a copy of the letter, but I think there was some confusion in in the way you understood it. And I, and I don't know. I'm just I'm guessing. But if you live on a Class Six Town Road, you can do maintenance yourself. If you wanted to plow, if you wanted to add gravel to it, if you wanted to clear out the culvert, you can do all that stuff. But per the state law, you are supposed to have permission from the select board or the road agent, whatever. And so there was people, this all kind of stemmed from winter of 2020. Yeah. So the letter came out because people wanted to do stuff up there. And in opening up this whole thing and bringing everything to light and seeing all of this stuff, the letter was drafted because people were snow machining up there in the wintertime. Technically, that's against the law unless the town decides that it's okay to snow machine on the Class 6 road, which so they did. So they just made it so you had to have permission, which is the way the law reads. If you want to put gravel up there because there's a, a run out that I haven't fixed and you want to fix it, you're allowed to do that, but you need permission. And I think that's the basis of what that letter was. If you wanted to plow, you know, you had to go see the town and get permission from the town to plow because that's what it says you have to do in the state law. Well, so, okay, hold oh, on, hold on, hold on, please. Hold on. Marty, did you have another comment then? I mean, Frank? You. Peter. 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 Put on this. Um, I think that somebody put it well that April 1st to November 1st is basically not really the way it ought to be. It probably ought to be, you know, uh, uh, from the last thaw mm -hmm. to the first snow. Mm -hmm. Yes. You know, where, or, you know, to give flexibility yeah. to the Okay. These guys to be able to do it at an appropriate interval when you know it makes sense to and it's possible to do the spring, summer, and fall maintenance, you know, or the winter maintenance. But spring, summer, and fall just sort of basically starts spring last, um, uh, uh, yeah. last thaw. Yeah. Fall being first snow. That's it. Yep. I agree with Peter. The first time I read that letter, which Mark and Marty showed it to me, it's a little confusing. I mean, I shook my head and had to read it three or four times because it does come across that they're asking the people up there to do the maintenance. That was the first thing that came to me when I read it. Now, after I read it a few times, like Pat said, I said, well, I think what they mean is if you want to do the maintenance, you can. But it's definitely, definitely a confusing, poorly written waiver. <laughs> I'll let Peter know. Go ahead. I'm <laughs> just kidding. So, we do Yeah, I'm making some notes here. Um, listen, and I appreciate all of this because. We can always improve things to make sure that the communication is better so it serves the purpose that it's intended to. David, did you have a comment? No. 
I, I think, already did. I think you were you you answered it and Peter okay. did so. Go, go. I just wanted to comment on the waiver because the waiver does state that the owner does hereby forever release and discharge the town, its officers, agents, and employees from obligation of maintaining Iron Mountain Road. And any claim of nature, whether in tort or otherwise, which owner might have against the town for any loss or damage, including those incurred through failure to provide municipal services, including police, fire, ambulance. Um, I would just like to request that the town continues to maintain Iron Mountain Road seasonally, not in the winter time, mm -hmm. as was stated in the last meeting, which was not correct, but I am very, very grateful for the maintenance that we have, and my concern is I would like to request that the town considers that Iron Mountain Road continue to be emergency status because right now it currently is emergency status mm -hmm. and I too have read the book um, I have gone through it a lot um, so thank you Mr. Kelly for maintaining the road and um, I just want to make sure that if there is an emergency that Mr. Purley and his crew could come up and rescue me rescue hikers I mean you know, that's all we're asking. We, we just want it to be maintained. And I do believe the grading is, is great, but I also know that ditches need to be, to be dug um, in order for drainage on the road. So thank you for considering. And, and Marty, did you have one more comment? Yes, uh, I am not going to maintain the road. <laughs> <laughs> I have a comment. Yes. He's 80, and I'm close to it, and I really would love, if I fall and break my hip, or he falls and breaks his shoulder again, that we could get an ambulance up there. Yep. And we're at the sure. very last end, three miles in. I don't think we're going to stop doing that. I think that's, right. that's, that's, yeah. that's yeah. the goal, obviously. So yeah. Right. And going back to the intent of what the right. goal is. Right. Yeah. But the waiver was releasing yeah. us from that and that we're so all improve. on the same page. So let's improve the, Thank you. the language and the waiver and we'll come back with something that hopefully will be uh, better understood. Thank you. Okay. That's all we have. Thank you. Did you have a comment? Sure. So I'm, I'm William Abbott with the Upper Saco Valley Land Trust. Mm -hmm. um, so I just, in the, in the interest of also uh, letting known things be known, um, <laughs> correcting some of the misstatements that occurred at the last select board meeting, um, I would like to point out that the Hayes Farm is still private property. I think there was a, a comment that, that was made about it going into trust or into public, uh, being treated as if it were a public park. And so I wanted to make it clear that the Upper Saco Valley Land Trust holds a conservation easement on that property. Right. And that easement allows for a public trail to go through the property. But the property still is private property. Right, it's not a picnic site. Exactly, it's not a picnic site. And I think it's the Willits family's generosity that has allowed you know, the, the use over the years, and the Schoonmills too, um, right next door. So I just wanted to clarify that position. If anybody has questions about what a conservation easement is, it's, you know, come see me, uh, shoot me an email. Um, but really briefly, you know, the development rights on that property have been extinguished, so it can no longer be built on or subdivided. Um, so that, that's, that's really where our role stops and starts. And we are here to, as, a, as an, an entity that has a legal interest in property up there, we would like to see this come to a mutual, mutually agreeable end. Um, but our, obviously our position is slightly different since we don't own the property. Yep. What about parking up there? As you said, you heard me, there's so much traffic well, up there, right? You know, hmm. it's, how are you gonna live in it? You know, yeah, in so the other yeah. thing I would say is that, that the heightened use is not because it was put into conservation or not. Right. You know, we have properties over in East Conway that are gems, and I'm always the only car in the parking lot. Um, I would say that the culprit here is Instagram and Facebook. Mm -hmm. It's happening on Jackson Falls, yeah. et cetera, et cetera. We're all, we're all aware that a few locations are being overused, and that is a tricky subject. Yeah. Um, the parking lot right now that's up at the top of 
of Iron Mountain Road is on the town's right of way. So the town owns a portion of that parking lot. We need to get a survey crew up there to determine exactly where that boundary line is. But none of that parking area is currently in the easement area that we control, to my knowledge. Um, so again, it's the, it's the generosity of the Willits family and the town to allow the parking. We did, we did implement an overflow parking area last year that's a quarter of a mile down the road. Again, that's on the Willits' property. Um, so that, that overflow parking area is on the area that is in easement with us. Um, so does that answer your question? Are there any signs right that, that indicate that that's available? Yes. People? Yes. Yep. We haven't been up there this year. Yeah, we go here for the Yeah, we put up, <laughs> I believe we put up those signs last fall okay. for the overflow parking. And Marty mows it. Yeah. So I will say that um, I've been in Jackson my whole life. 48 years. I just purchased Iron Mountain 276, and I have noticed a huge influx of cars driving up our road in the past. Everywhere. Like, Everywhere. Four, four years, but I, I, I think to your point, Instagram does produce more traffic, and, and, and they, they beat up the road more, and I think that's something that is, I think our side of it is, it's and just I mean, nice to have you know, it. When you have Google Maps and all of those mm -hmm. places that Correct. you <laughs> yeah. can't have any control over uh, what, how the other guys are going. It's, yeah, it's no, it, it just happens. So, but, but the road needs to be kind of graded a couple times a year, which I think, you know, you would agree. Hi, I'm Pat Schoolman, better half. Yes. <laughs> um, and I have talked to quite a few of the hikers as they're parking or I have to wait for them to park. Mm -hmm. A lot of the local hotels and places of residence are saying to young families, oh, there's an easy hike up on Iron Mountain. So, so um, a lot of them are being sent by where they're staying. Right. To you know, um, that brings up a point that we had about Jackson Falls and the promotion of Jackson yeah. Falls. So we had... Um, gotten with Kathleen with the Chamber of Commerce and trying to uh, make our advertising consistent in advertising Jackson Falls as a place to, a scenic place to come and visit, but not an all-day picnic area, and we would say not an all-day picnic right. area, but certainly it, the more um, negative PR you can, or pulling back on the PR, I guess that you can do to say where there are better parking spots um, for better easy hikes in Jackson, or whatever, uh, you know, I mean, that I guess is just trying to do yeah. some of the work to do that. But, yeah. and, but thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. And, 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 and unfortunately, you. Marty and Pat have witnessed people parking on our land right. to, to go hike Iron Mountain. Yeah. And, you know, that's, that's not what I would recommend people to do was to, to park on my private property, right. but they have nowhere else to park, so they park on our land. Jerry? Um, just wanted to kind of clarify some things to help with some of the expectations for people up there. Um, I was on the select board in 2009 when we designated an emergency use road, and we did that specifically so that we could maintain it as a class six road because the town's really not interested in having that a class five road because that would be really undue expense on the town that we can't really afford to do. Um, and that designation, you know, yeah, we can get an ambulance up there in June. We can't get one up there in January. The town's not obligated to send an ambulance up there ever. And so that's kind of why that language is in there about it's kind of use at your own risk. Um, if, if the town does, if the police can't get up there when they can get up there, it's, it's, it's fantastic. But just understand the town's not obligated to send them up there. It's primarily, the emergency designation really is, the, the primary reason for that is so that if there's a forest fire or one of the houses up there catches on fire, the fire department can get there. Um, and that's the, the primary reason for it. It's not to give access to ambulances um, for emergency services like that. So the town's not obligated to, um, but certainly that they can, it's fantastic. <coughs> yeah. But that's why that language is in there, so that you understand that you're using the property kind of at your own risk. Okay, um, one more comment, I'm gonna move on, Marty. Yes. yes, I'd like to thank you for your time and consideration uh, on this uh, very important to us uh, subject. And uh, thank you again. So we appreciate all of you hearing from all of you as well. Thank you guys.
All right, thank you very much. We are going to move on, but we will get back to you with some recommendations for the waiver. Okay. All right. Pat Kelly, Highway Equipment. Oh, sorry. <laughs> that one up. All right. Almost missed the fire station presentation. Okay, Jerry, are you going to start with this? Sure. Want me to come up? Or? Um, we'll have, we're going to see if a few folks want to. Uh, So this all kind of began when, when Jay approached the selectmen probably about two years ago now um, about renovating the existing fire stations so that to making room for the new fire, fire truck. And at the time, several community members said, why are we sinking you know, money into this building? Um, it just it doesn't make sense. So um, the committee formed after that to kind of explore the idea of either renovating the existing building um, or building a new fire station. Um, so we spent a lot of time um, analyzing things and, and looking at different designs and um, kind of um, came to the conclusion that the, um, that the town needs a new fire station. Um, so why does the town need a new fire station? Um, primarily, um, I'm going to off the cheat notes here, um, the building's physically too small for proper storage of equipment and space to manage fire department operations. Um, it doesn't meet requirements of Americans with Disabilities Act for accessibility. Um, it's not designed for um, proper hazmat protection and exposes firefighters to many carcinogens. Um, doesn't meet many NFPA 1500 minimum requirements for occupational safety and health. Um, the building envelope is um, not is uh, very energy inefficient. Um, energy costs much more than new heating, ventilating, and cooling. Um, it's insufficient for um, fire training space and op uh, options for shared community use space. Um, physical location on site is poor for vehicle man maneuver maneuverability and volunteer parking. Um, there's no room for expansion basically on the existing building um, and any continued band-aid maintenance on it, it's, it's an outdated building. So we're just kind of adding band-aids to a building that's outdated. Um, so there was a lot of discussion about renovation versus new building um, in the feasibility study. Um, and there was a lot of discussion about location um, in the study and benefits to the community. And what it really came down to was the value that would be derived, um, the benefit versus the cost. Um, and in really kind of analyzing the existing building, um, there isn't really a whole lot we can do to the building to solve some of the problems um, that, that are in the, or any of the problems that are in the building. About the only thing we could do to the building is make some room in the back of the building for a new fire truck. But it doesn't address any of the other problems with the building. And what we really have in that building is um, it's, a, it's a building that's an unsafe working environment. And we have a volunteer fire department that is on call and ready to go anytime that we need them. And we have them working in a building that's unsafe. Um, and there's not a lot we can do to change that building to make it safe. Um, so that's why the, the, the committee came to the conclusion that we're recommending to the selectmen that, um, that we build a new fire station. Um, and, we spent a lot of time um, in um, looking at different locations for the building, um, lots of different designs, and, and we're kind of at a point now where we're ready to have public hearings to, to kind of present to the community where we're at with design and location of the building um, and to get feedback from the community on, on how we want to proceed. Um, so that's where we're at with things. Um, and Barbara, do you have anything you want to add or any committee member want to add anything? Yeah. 
Um, I just want to say that I'm the numbers person. I always ask, what is it going to cost? What is it going to cost? And so if you're all wondering that, we have no idea what it's going to cost yet. <laughs> We're not at that point yet. And we don't want to scare anybody with numbers or a range of numbers. So when we talk about the inefficiencies of the building and the difference between any kind of a renovation versus a new building, we know it's going to be a large number that we're going to throw out there when the time comes. But the improvement and the future use that we would get out of building a new fire station and the improved health and access to all of the firefighters, the public space, it just, it, it's a logical decision. There have been over six renovations over however many years, hundreds of thousands of dollars have been put into the building. The maintenance is inefficient. The costs to run it are inefficient energy, as Jerry said. So um, we don't know what it's going to cost at <coughs> all. But when we talk about a new building, we've considered as much as we can for location and size and what the town really needs to maintain a fire station. So I hope that adds any kind of clarity as far as dollars. <coughs> None. Um, and what we're really hoping that we, when we schedule the public hearing is to get a lot of feedback from the community. We know that a project like this is going to have a lot of resistance. There's going to be people that, that don't want to do it. Um, and what we'd like um, is for people to, to tell us what, what it is you, you don't like about the new fire station. Is it cost? Um, is it the needs or requirements? The more we know about why you might be opposed to it, the better we can answer questions like that. So. I was just curious if did anybody put any thought into uh, an ambulance or even the police station being all incorporated in one location instead of just the fire department. So a, that's a good question, John. And, um, I would say that we, we considered that a lot up front. Um, in our first several meetings, we discussed that a lot. Um, and um, this, the, the main problem with, with looking at it from that standpoint is the size of that building, it would, it would have to be, it would be extremely large. You know, we've gotten the design and location down to a point where um, you know, Jay and Bill um, have done a lot of work with the fire department to, to um, come together with an idea that is, is our basic needs in a fire station. Um, and that's a large building, um, but if you were to add ambulances and police to that, now you're talking a building that's gargantuan in size and that we feel a better use for the, the public space that we have is that we, if, if at some point in the future we want to have a fire uh, police department built um, or an ambulance uh, building built, it would be met, better met on another part of the property that we have and that we'd be able to fit those things in. But we, we really are considering um, the, the, the use of the overall property that we have is limited. Um, so we don't want to fill up an entire space you know, with the fire department and say, okay, now you can't do this here or there. We really are considering to make the campus of this place function a lot better. Um, that's something that we've been very much heavily considering from the start. Um, so specifically to the ambulance, John, the, the number one issue that the, that the committee sees is that um, the practicality of Jackson having its own ambulance service and when that would be. Someday in the future, maybe, maybe but if you're talking the next 10, 15, 20 years, the, the expense that it would add to the, to the operating budget on a yearly basis, and the expense of an ambulance, and the expense of um, having a building for it, um, they're too high to consider them now or in the immediate future. Um, you know, it's, it's, we consider it heavily, and our, our best option for the town of Jackson for, for now is to continue to share services with Bartlett for the ambulance, because basically because costs would be, be, be too high to do it. Um, is a primary reason, and staff. Um, you know, the ambulance service we have now is very difficult to staff. Um, so staffing one on our own, someday in the future maybe, but um, it wouldn't need to be part of the fire station because there's plenty of options on, on town land that we could, we could build a fire, uh, fire a police station and an ambulance um, building if we need to. Damon? Are public uh, hearings scheduled yet? We haven't scheduled one yet. Um, it's kind of why we're here today, is to kind of you know, bring the selectmen up to speed with where, where we're at um, and um, to, to know whether we should continue and actually have a public hearing. So um, that's why we're here today. So um, we'll get together probably very soon after today to determine what a public hearing would be. Uh, originally, we were thinking sometime in the early fall uh, or uh, early September. Um, summertime, you know, people are usually out doing summertime things that we're thinking that maybe in September or October we'd have the first public hearing for this. Thanks, Jerry. Yes, right. 
Yeah, you know, there have been some numbers bandied about in terms of what this might cost, two million, three million, four million dollars. I've heard all of those numbers. I'm not sure where they came from, but I think probably through some of the studies you can potentially what a building like what they're talking about want to build. I just want to say this though, that you can be pro fire department, people that work for our fire department, and we need them and they're good people, all the men and women who work there. But you don't necessarily have to be for a new fire station. You can still be pro fire department, but maybe not wanting to spend what they perhaps what number we're gonna find out is gonna cost us. So just just think of that also. Okay. We still have some time. Like you said, there's going to be some hearings. Barbara said the most important thing. We have all of this stuff, but we don't have a price. So it's kind of hard to say, I endorse that. I think that's wonderful. You know, We have to look ahead. Um, and so maybe we'll get more numbers, and then we'll get to the decision that we have to be made. I'm not so sure that everything that Jerry said <clears throat> about it doesn't meet our, need, uh, our, our needs and it's unsafe and we can't do the job that we need to do because we've been doing the job. We're an amazing fire department in equipment and people. And we've been doing it what we have. So just all of this has got to be considered as we move forward. That's absolutely and I get it. And I get it. Okay. Absolutely Frank I would say that um, I didn't mean to phrase it as we're not meeting the needs now. Um, it's you know these guys have been, and the men and women that work in the fire department have been, you know they're there every day, um, and uh, they're getting the job done. Um, and the building, you know, they have a building to work in for sure. Um, but um, it, there's no doubt that the current building does not meet any of the current codes um, and what's required of a modern fire department. Um, that's a kind of a different subject, though. Um, but as to the price and the cost of this, the reason why we don't have the cost, we're not trying to hide anything there. Um, at some point in time, the <coughs> financial aspect of this, does this make good financial sense for the town, is an argument that's going to have to win in order for this to be successful. Right. Meaning it's going to have to make financial sense to do it. Right. Um, and that's going to be a cost. The only cost that we were kind of really nailed down was renovating the existing building. Um, and we had some numbers. Um, from the $150,000 range just to blow out the back of the building to somewhere between $700 million to renovate the existing building to make it more code compliant. Um, those numbers we have pretty sufficiently, but as far as the new building is concerned, we haven't gotten to, to cost yet because we haven't really finished the design yet. And that's, we're not quite at that point in the process yet. And we're in a year where construction costs is a does it cost two hundred fifty dollars a yeah. square foot or three hundred eighty-five dollars right. a square foot? Right. Right. We just right. don't know, right. um, and we won't know that until we can bring the project to a further point along, along the way. Um, and I think that's what we need to do for the public hearing: um, educate the public as to why this is on the docket and we're talking about it. So, anyone, if anyone ever wants to see the current fire station, they can talk to Jay or, or Peter or anyone and, and go see the fire station. But I think the public hearing will offer a good time for folks to understand exactly why we're talking about the inefficiency and, and uh, the dangers of the current fire station. So, uh, Peter? I, I would just say, Frank, I appreciate your comment about us getting the job done. Thank you very much. But I would just say that while we've been getting the job done, the building really has been getting the job done. It has, hasn't for a long time. It's really hard for us as a, a department in the modern day era to, co to go and talk to people about mm -hmm. fire safety when we have a building that's not sprinkler, that doesn't meet electrical codes, that doesn't meet insulation codes, and is really not a very safe or um, protective environment to work in. So while, again, I appreciate your comments, I, I think something has to be done, because the status quo regarding the building just isn't going to, it just doesn't work anymore. Bill? I just wanted to add, the building's 75 years old, and I joined the fire department in 1968 when I was 14 years old, and I've seen many fixes, additions, remodels, renovations, you name it, I've seen it at that, in that building. And it's just, it, we, here we are at Jackson, and we love Jackson, and we make Jackson beautiful, and we have a town building that's housing, and Jay could probably put a better a couple of million dollars of equipment replacement world, and it's it doesn't need code. It, we can't in a band aid put a small bump on the back 
you know, in the new standards with equipment, when we buy a replacement vehicle that's 32 years old, with the standards from the federal government, with emissions and all of that, we have no place to put it. And that's, that's your water source that backs us up for anything outside the precinct. It's, it, it's very critical. The whole thing, it comes down in my mind, do we do it now, do we do it later? And my very informal and unofficial research in 48 years of the building industry, the one thing I do know, right now, building is crazy. For values, everyone knows, it's all gone wild. But we will undoubtedly look at probably a bond issue for this thing, because we're talking a lot of money if we build a new one. For every year you delay that, your bond payment is, is going to be less than the increase in cost of delay every year you go forward. And, and that's something that I feel very confident that will be the trip case. But it depends on what the, ta the town is, decides what they want to do. And I just would like to encourage people to have an open mind. Uh, as I talked to Frank before he was elected, have an open mind and see if you can justify the need, and then if you can justify the cost, and when do you do it? That's all I wanted to add to that. But it is an old building. It's the old. It, it's, it's the oldest town-owned property other than the the original library that I know. Uh, God, we've got a beautiful library over here. But you, people come see it. And the other thing, I hate the word public hearing because we're not really at a public hearing yet. I think it's more of a public meeting to get input, and we really want input from all of the townspeople. If we do something major, we want it to fit, we want it to look good, we want just comments, and, and we, so we would encourage people to really, really look at this. It's, 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 it's the town's project, not the, Thank you. Thank you, Justin. So um, the reason why this is on the agenda is basically the committee wanted to to the select board uh, the next steps. So, uh, uh, Frank, uh, are you in favor of at least moving forward to the next step of public information sessions, public hearings?
fairly unhappy with it. It's number one, it's too big. It's the smallest one that they make, and it's really not any cheaper, except it is a lot cheaper. Mm -hmm. uh, but money wise, it wasn't cheaper. So that didn't really work. So I looked at um, a Volvo, a small, a small Volvo. I looked at a small John Deere, and I'm looking at a small cat. Um, I have prices on everything. I've got trade equivalents and discussing with my liaison. Uh, one of the uh, steel right now is like crazy, crazy, crazy. Um, equipment is going up two or three or four times a year instead of once a year. Um, <clears throat> if we wait until uh, like March, which we can totally do, we wait until March. I've got a price. I've got prices on machines. If we buy them today, they all have uh, Cat Volvo and John Deere have machines that are available to purchase now. Mm -hmm. And uh, the John Deere, for instance, would cost us fourteen in rough numbers, fourteen thousand dollars more if we waited until March. This is at least two price increases. Can you tell me what what are we talking about dollar wise? Um, the John Deere was the, my pick. He mm -hmm. said, what do you want? I said, mm -hmm. I want the John Deere. The John Deere's price rate today, we buy the machine that is available, is 177500 And then is this in the, is this funded already? Oh, you said you were going to ask for it next year, so. Well, I was, I mean, I was potentially going to ask for it to spend the money in 2022. Mm -hmm. We have 90% of the money in the capital reserve fund. Um, we are a little bit short. Uh, it was short from the sidewalk machine that we've never mm -hmm. replaced, um, that we pulled from that fund. Um, technically, I think I'm like $18,000 short, so. Where's the trade-in value? Yeah, 39000 is what John Deere is gonna give us for the trade. Uh, and Cat and Volvo were only $25,000 in trade. So a total dollars are probably what I care about the most because you can play around with numbers for purchase and trade. So it would well, be 177.5 for John Deere. 138.5 is the trade. Yes. Yeah, so what we would write a check for, right. or, or whatever, uh, is is the bottom line on the John Deere. I got two. He right. gave me a rough budget number, and then he sharpened his pencil and gave me um, the final price, which he knocked some down off of, and then increased the trade. Okay. Which you can yeah. look at that if you want to uh, How old is the loader we have? It is 18 years old. And in, like, we could, and so it's 138.5. Mm -hmm. I think the cat's 140, bottom line, and the Volvo is like 136. Um, so not it's all 138.5, so we're right in the middle on the John Deere. Yeah. And it's a little bigger machine. It's a little. It's a. It's a little nicer all around. Um, <coughs> is that your preference? Yeah. Yep. Yeah. After trying, I haven't tried a cat because they won't bring me a demo. Um, so I could drive to Londonderry mm. and get in one. Uh, John Deere. Deere. Preference. Mm. You said John Deere was right. Um, the Volvo would be nice, but I looking at the Volvo. Uh, Ten years out, I think we're gonna start to have. Like little things go. I mean, uh, I'm looking to try and buy something for 18 years, and Volvo would be fine. It's only two thousand dollars less, but in 12 years, and you need something, are the parts as readily available as they are? <coughs> Cat and John Deere. It's like it's just no, no comparison. Can I, can I, can I answer? Talk to him. Yes. Well, okay. So make sure. Yeah. Did you want to see that? Um, um, you know, Pat made a couple of points that, first of all, John Deere is, is the vehicles that the, whole, the state's using, the entire state of New Hampshire. I mean, and they're so, leased. The state is leasing those, and they're buying them with, uh, in the lease, built into the lease, the states aren't doing any maintenance. John Deere is coming and doing all of their maintenance. Mm -hmm. And in this price, and in, in all the prices, there's a, at least a five-year warranty right, on them. This is a seven-year, and it's a little more hours. Um, and the sales guy was kind of selling me the, on the fact that there's generally a service tech in Carroll County, co mm -hmm. County, because of all of the state sheds have a John Deere piece of equipment, and it's built into those contracts. Mm -hmm. Do they offer financing? Yeah, they they offer. There's like 
they said because we're a town, we can like do anything we want. I mean, like I know John Deere always has zero percent financing for consumer products and agriculture products. Do they offer anything that aggressive for a town? I think that it can from I don't know on zero percent I know like there's there's lease purchases there's mm -hmm. all of that stuff is available and I mean I, I hear that most of the money 90 percent of the money is in the fund and if it were, were this year it would be next year um, and we've gotten our money's worth it sounds like out of the current motor that we have but I guess I would like to know if there are any financial incentives to financing it over a little bit of time to um, make sure that we have the funding for it the only and the only question that I, I I'm not sure about is I know that there's a huge municipal discount mm -hmm. so like offering zero percent I'm not sure right because I'm, of that. yeah I'm just wondering how uh, he had to he went through a spiel like John Deere tells them how much mm -hmm. they have to sell the machine for and mm -hmm. they have to sell it within a dollar of that figure right and that's a like a nationwide you know, John Deere tells Nortrax, this is what you have to sell the machine for. Mm -hmm. um, and Which dealer are we working with? In it's, place? well, it's Nortrax out of Concord. Gotcha. Are, there, are there any other local dealers that deal with this? Because I know there's a bunch Everything's of like smaller. So Everything. I mean, the smaller, um, when you go a step down from this, yeah. they can't sell those. You have to it's go down the green to like and then the, the yellow one. Yeah. Yeah. Questions? Is this on schedule for being replaced? Yeah. And what's the next big ticket item you got after this one? Uh, Equipment-wise, nothing for at least four or five years. We've got I mean, a promise. One. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it's yeah, it's scheduled. Uh, you know, but the I mean, the biggest, the only reason why I'm coming and saying let's move on this maybe quick is because the amount of money we're going to save. Because it's a uh, thirty-nine thousand dollars we're giving our trade, which is today's trade. If we keep it until March, it's not going to be worth that much, and there's going to be two price increases. Can we so just bump that up? To August first is a is a four percent increase. Okay. I think on anything new, um, where they've already purchased this, they own it. I don't think it's. And it's also you sent me a text that shows that it's made in the yeah. USA. Yeah, it is made. In. Yes. So, Sorry. how are you going to reduce your budget for the year to come up with a shortfall? I'm not sure. <laughs> what is the shortfall? About fourteen thousand. Oh, it's a matter of. It's a matter of. I mean, do we lease? Do we lease finance? Do we? I don't know financially what the best move is. Mm -hmm. I would do like to know what the financing is, just to yeah, just to see if we can um, have the option to finance some of it. Um, just. Curiosity, I, I think there is to know. His words to me were, because we're a town, we can basically make up whatever we want, and they'll say yes. Okay. So, okay. Cool. Well, let's pay 100000 for it. No. Yeah. And, um. and what is this? There's something else about this. It's a self-greasing kind of Well, equipment. one of the it's things equipment. that we've, we've added into all the machines that I've looked at was all grease, all wood. And so it's, if it's in harsh winter and it doesn't get greased, it automatically, the machine automatically doesn't. It's all timed deal. Is that sort of a new invention for these things? Or? Well, we'll be the jack around for a while, but it. it's it's an expensive option. But it, over the course of an eighteen year, something else to break. You know, it's <laughs> it's like a seven or eight thousand dollar option. But over the course of eighteen years, when you look at taking you know half an hour to grease it, it you know I mean, it's it's not that big of a deal. It's mm -hmm. just it gets. That machine kind of gets neglected because of the winter months, and you know you jump in at load, you jump in at load, you jump in at load, you go to sand, and, mm -hmm. and it, you know depending on how busy you are in the winter, you may get degrees in it, or you may just not be on your priority list because mm -hmm. you're trying to fall. And so, but um, yeah, you could be up in iron mode when you slow down. Right. <laughs> Just Bill, did you have a comment? I, I, just, I just a comment, and I'm, I'm not, don't want this to come out wrong, but when the selectmen made the decision to buy the sidewalk machine, that was an unplanned purchase, and you took the money out of one of the two reserve uh, trust, capital reserve tr expandable trust articles that were really to deal with five, uh, highway department 
trucks, equipment, and what have you. And I asked that question when you said it at that town meeting you bought. I asked the selectman's question. I asked it last year's budget time. Do you plan on, because you had said, we will replace that. And last budget season, I never got that answer. And you, and you didn't put any money in. You got an opportunity right now, looking, just listening to what I hear, and talking a little bit with Pat, that you've got to save a ton of dough, probably what you 10 times have already spent and haven't replaced it by doing it now. I would think that you would be, that would be very encouraging, plus the fact that I know on the operating budget, state statute allows the selectmen to, to shift line items, but not overspend the bottom line. But is there a way, if you've got two uh, expendable trust articles between the two, that small difference you're short, you might have the ability to use that money so you're not really borrowing any money. I just wanted to voice my opinion about that. I, I, I think the sidewalk machine put a tremendous amount of issues to bed. It's been a great thing. I think everyone that walks the village loop, and they want, and it, it, that's a, that was a great decision, probably long overdue. But we should, you know, we've really, on the big $200,000 to $500,000 purchases of equipment, We've really tried to, and I know there's arguments, do we borrow money at 0% today and not put capital reserve in where we, pay, we already paid taxes on that contribution? There's that argument, but at the same time, boy, it's a whole lot easier to spend, borrow 20 grand than 200 grand yeah. and make a decision that actually saving the town money in just one year. Just, that's it's my not really saving, it's actually spending less. <laughs> sort of a purchase and sales agreement and come up with how we want to yeah. finance it. And the only reason why I'm saying that is because equipment is very, very, very hard to come by right. at the moment. And basically is they have, it's what we've tried out. There's a couple of things that I, I it's been used. It's, mm -hmm. it's got 60 hours on, it's been demoed once. Gotcha. Um, and it, like it doesn't scare me, it kind of makes me a little happier because it has 60 hours on yep. it and somebody's tried it, so yeah. some little thing has been fixed. Um, or it's like hasn't rear, you know, if it's gonna catastrophically fail because it's new, yeah. it would have done that. Oh, it's got a work, a seven year warranty, you said? Yeah. Okay. And so my only concern is, is I'm, uh, yeah, I'm sure, great. I'd love so to have a loader to go into winter with. Yeah. I don't need one, but I'm looking at, Twenty to twenty-five thousand dollars in savings if we buy it mm -hmm. now instead so of waiting in March and the quarter, and that's probably guaranteed savings. Um, yeah, the other thing is inventory and parts, and with the pandemic so, stopping yeah. production of things, it's slowing things up. And that's that's okay. really what I'm looking at is is buying a machine that will last fifteen to twenty years somewhere mm -hmm. in there, with pretty much problem free, mm -hmm. and. Does it make sense to wait six months and spend twenty five thousand right. dollars? I don't think it makes sense, but I don't. so that's that's my own. Uh, I'm not trying to force it just because I want something new. I just trying to say, smart. trying to do the right decision, I guess. Mm -hmm. And so, well, you made the right decision. Okay. Do we want to make a motion to move forward on this, or do we want to find out more information on the financing like, thing? I'd like to make a motion that we. We proceed with all of what Pat had to say and get into an agreement to buy this vehicle and get it here as soon as possible at the best price. Can we do that? I will second. All in favor? Aye. 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 We'll talk. Thank you. Yeah, let us know about Good if job. you find any other financing arrangements out yeah. just for um, yeah. information and if it sounds yeah. attractive to um, work with the shortfall, then we'll go that way. But. Um, yeah, I appreciate I I the information. Have him come talk to Julie or come talk to you. Yeah, or come well we can do a phone call. And we'll, we'll yeah. figure out how. Or if he's going to be down, the you know, yeah. down the garage and come yeah. down. Yeah, yeah. yeah. and we'll, have, we'll just figure out what makes the most sense. Yeah. And then we'll report back on this time. Perfect. Thanks, Ben. Okay. Monday.
just FYI, we're going to start construction. We're going to start work on the front. Monday, Gary. Good. Good. Um, I'm sorry. I got all those. Thank you. All right, thanks, Pat. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Yeah, thanks. Sorry, Mr. Frank. It's good to see you there. Thank you. Thank you. Yes. I've got it, right? Okay. Here we go. All right. The next agenda item is the police department donation. Uh, we have a check from Hagrid and Claire Goodwitz for $100 to the Jackson Police Department. And, um, discussions about some septic discrepancies, but because of the length of this meeting, we are putting it on hold until the August 10th meeting. So thanks guys for being here and uh, we'll discuss further in the next meeting. Um, the next item is the E911 signage. I received some information from a resident that just said, hey, do people that have short-term rentals advise their people where they're staying and what their addresses are and um, and what do we do to encourage more E91 conformity and signage? So uh, Tom Gregg used to handle this uh, as an emergency management director. So Emily and I talked um, in the same spirit and I'm gonna um, reach out to Katie um, Reardon that handles a lot of good communication for short-term rental owners and, and know as you go or know as you come to town and make sure that there is good communication for people knowing where they're staying. And then um, we'll make sure that we keep sending emails and communications to residents that don't have proper E911 E911 signage on their um, properties. Yes, Will. Uh, this is Will Rising. Um, for the record, what exactly is E911? It's the address that tells emergency responders where to go. So like our address is 60 Moody Farm Road, so they know to go there. Most people in town have PO Box, but they don't know exactly what their street number is or whatever. So it's making sure that there's proper signage at their property so when the fire department comes, they know where to turn into your driveway. And also for renters and things, making sure that they have that information so if they have to call for an emergency, they can communicate that address. Okay, thank you very much. You're welcome. Can I just Yes, Emily? Um, so the E on that is enhanced. Oh, one. Um, nice. As they expanded that. Um, I think, too, just for the record, as we had talked a little bit about it, to possibly look at the um, application for the short term rentals mm -hmm. and see if there needs to be some language in that. I think that's what you mentioned in, ter yeah, in terms for, of talking to Katie right, for her and experience. That might come in part of our housekeeping updates that we'll do to the conditional use permit right. and, and the short term rental application. But we do have good information. I've reviewed it on the website, um, both through the Emergency Management Department webpage and elsewhere. But and, and ju just as a clarification on E911, Peter Benson, mm -hmm. in the absence of uh, Czar Henry, I, I'll answer for him. Um, uh, the, the, the number corresponds to the mileage. So whatever your number is, if you're 30, if your number is 30, you're 0.15 miles from the nearest road intersection. So we can tell literally to the set to the mileage where your house is located. That's so interesting. Um, yeah. I thought you'd pick your own You number. don't pick your number. <laughs> People try. Yeah. People yeah. try. Yeah. No, it's it's by mileage. So my I'm seven thirty eight Carter Notch Road, so you divide that in half and that is the distance from the Wentworth to my house. So we know all the road mileages. Um, E nine one one also um, mandates, dictates reflective signs at a certain height. So we see a lot of signs that that are really great in the summertime, and then they're really buried in the wintertime. Right. Um, and I would say just informally, I would say we're probably less than 50% of legal E911 signs in the town at this point. Yeah. Um, we're focusing on 
um, voluntary enforcement and voluntary um, participation and just the plug, we do sell the reflective metallic signs at the firehouse for our cost, which is $20. Yeah, and thank you for saying that too, because I know that when needed, you guys reach out to property owners and everyone does as they recognize places, but to know that they can buy the signage from the fire department is important as well. So, thank you. Um, I um, need to have a motion to approve $60 a year so Emily can have a very own email address as the emergency management director. Yes. I need, so, a, I need a motion to be made on that. It's not one word that Johnson I'll make a motion that Emily gets all the money she needs for this. For her email. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm not, I'm not know, second I'm in that. Second that. <laughs> <laughs> I will second the $60, though. $60 it is. Going once, going twice. Everyone in favor of $60 for Emily's email. Uh, aye. 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 Thank you. Thank you. Pull it out of my there you go. <laughs> All right. Powerball um, winner. We have a um, Whitney's in liquor license, which um, is granting access to Whitney's for serving alcohol outside of their licensed area to accommodate a wedding being held on Saturday, July 24th. The ex this extended area would be the winter skating rink area, which of course was last week, but um, it was signed by two selectmen prior to this meeting. So it's a formality approving the liquor license. Um, so I will take a motion to subsequently approve this. I will make that motion. No second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. No one got hurt in the uh, uh, um, liquor license details. John Allen. All right, well, we had uh, an issue over the weekend with some loud music, and I think one of the things we probably need to do is revisit that license and have some specific details how to measure the sound. I, it was 85 decibels, but it needs to be at a certain distance, because you can be next to the speaker and it'd be 85, but if you're a mile away, it's not 85. Mm -hmm. uh, so I think uh, we need to kind of tighten up the um, measuring component in order to have or report a violation because it's a little messy to try to enforce, I think. So, um, and maybe even have a fine imposed. I know that you know, we don't want people to not have weddings. I don't think that's our goal because these people have spent thousands of dollars on, on um, you know, booking these things in advance. And if we couldn't pull their license, you know, that would be pretty detrimental to that wedding party. Right. But I think maybe a fine might be appropriate for that particular party if they do go over that decibel rating or have, you know, at least potentially imposed, maybe not, you know, physically imposed it because mm -hmm. of extenuating circumstances or whatever. Um, but I, I think pulling a license would be pretty difficult to yeah. do with the weddings be adversely uh, a hardship on those people who spent thousands of dollars on, on yeah. wedding so, parties okay. and then suddenly, oh, no, they were too loud last wedding. I'm sorry, I'm going to pull the license. Yeah, that'd be tough. <laughs> Yeah. Um, I don't want to be reactive to to one circumstance or one situation that we had where it was extremely loud and disruptive. So um, we have four really important wedding venues in town and so far I feel like our noise ordinance and our rules about keeping tent walls down and stopping the music at 10 o'clock and everything has been pretty well followed. So we'll let's look at the the wording and see if there is something or if there are maybe understandings that we can have to make sure that there isn't um, noise and alcohol where it shouldn't be and that we don't have to have more visits, you know, because of noise, too much noise or, or noise past the deadlines and stuff. But I don't know if we want to well, send I know copies I, of the noise ordinance with it or? Well, I, I we, we, there are people in, in town who actually have in their contract, and maybe we can get privy copy of this, but mm -hmm. I don't know if they want to share or not, but one of the local businesses actually has a contract mm -hmm. with the wedding party and the DJ slash band yep. that says you will not play over this, and they can control that at the soundboard, right. and they have total control over it, and um, uh, having not personal experience, but first-hand knowledge that they will pull the plug on them, and they have pulled the plug Absolutely. on people. And I think you know that's something maybe we can 
maybe ask Ellie or whoever had to get that contract that we can pass on to other I actually, homeowners. Yeah, I actually have that because we're doing a wedding there soon, so oh, okay. um, we can look at some of the verbiage in that and yeah, we'll ask Ellie if that's okay, but that, yeah. Because they, they do measure, you know, at, at, the, at the wedding and, and yeah. they, they were very good about that. And, and, but and this one, they didn't have any knowledge of any decimal readings or any rules, and that was and kind of unfortunate. And the other thing is there's always different entertainers, whether they be DJs or live bands, so they may not be so aware of the strictness of our um, noise ordinance and making sure that it follows the rules. So um, additional communication, I think, will be warranted without pulling any plugs on anything. So. All right. Hello. Questions? Oh, hello. Hi. Could I make a comment, please? Yes. Sure. Um, and hi, John. How you doing? John and I live more or less on the same street. And we, we Could hear, you tell me your name, please? Oh, I'm sorry. Joan Kelly. Thank hi, you. Joan. Um, we, I live about, as a crow flies, about a mile from Eagle Mountain House. Mm -hmm. The noise can be unbelievable at Eagle Mountain House coming in our direction. So that where, where you take the uh, decibel reading, I think is critical because they have situated their tent in such a way as not to really have a noisy, have the noise going towards Eagle Mountain House. It's fairly quiet on Carter Notch Road there. But on this side, or to the east, it can be very noisy. I mean, I, I have written down certain songs of an era that I recognize <laughs> that I can hear. Over Memorial Day weekend, there was a Motown medley. <laughs> My Girl, ABC, Jackson 5, and Superstition, Stevie Wonder. I mean, it's that loud. That I have it on occasion, closed my doors, locked my windows, and still heard it. Yeah. So where you take that reading is really important. If you notice it, it does shut off at 10 o'clock at night. So there's a, there's they a have been doing pump. that okay. versus the 10.30 that it used to be. Yeah. Okay. And that's yeah, a bummer. I live on yeah. the mine and I can hear it on Saturdays and Sundays too, but I'll yeah. tell you, 10 o'clock gets and it gets nice and quiet. And I'm thinking, this is the sort of thing that yeah, happens in tourists. Whether time. you like it or not. <laughs> yeah. So I just wanted to give a comment to someone who is impacted by the noise mm -hmm. of the waves. And we yeah. all want each and every one of our venues to do what? Well, right. Um, Special quietly. Yes. <laughs> or at least be invited, quietly. right? Yeah. <laughs> Good idea. Motown will call you. Yeah. All right. Thank you for that comment, too. All right. Old Library Management Committee request. We have a letter from Alicia Hawks. Thank Ooh. you for being here today. Dear Jackson Select People. Appreciate that. Uh, the Old Library Management Committee requests your permission to have two outdoor clubs installed at the Old Library for use at Christmas for various gardening chores, etc. They will be installed on the lower part of the posts on either side of the ramp and will have covers to protect them from weather and snow buildup. They will be as unobtrusive as possible and will not compromise the historic character of the building. We obtained two quotes, one of which came from Tim DePetro, who has offered to do the work for free. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> we hope we'll approve this project and look forward to your decision. Sincerely, Alicia Hawks of the Old Library Management Committee. I will take a motion to approve this. I'll make a motion to be approved. I'll second it. All in favor, aye. And the old ladies yes. of the old library. <laughs> Well, Tim, in case, if I don't know that you know this, but Tim um, and and his wife completely remodeled the, oh. the house. <laughs> it's gorgeous. Unbelievable job. Um, and um, they're just thrilled to be in Jackson. And exactly. that was what he, he had said to Ellie when she went to him, Ellie Spears, when she yeah. went to him and asked him. So I think it's really pretty. That's fantastic. That's very good. Thank you so much. Yeah. Um, Okay, short-term rentals. Uh, since it is our second meeting, we have no new permits today. Um, <laughs> so we do have a correction on Bill Terry's comment from the last meeting. The planning board reviews the short-term application and provides comments to the select board. The select board should then vote as they normally would to approve or deny the application at the meeting. 
Um, so there was a big conversation that came down to sort of semantics. Does planning board either accepts an application or does not accept an application? If they don't accept it, it's because it's filled out improperly or there's another technical reason why they don't accept it. And when we vote on it, we have voted to not approve it. But since it hasn't ever really been accepted, we can't approve it anyway. So um, according to, I'll read this in, according to RSA 674-21.2, the planning board shall set forth its comments on the proposal in writing. Since the planning board voted not to accept the application, that should be our review comment and why we chose not to. The selectmen should then vote as they normally would to approve or not at the next meeting. So I misspoke in saying the select, selectmen should not vote. What this basically means is we're going to keep doing it the way we were doing it before, but we will state that it has not been accepted and we're not approving it versus we're just not approving it. So, hope well, that makes sense. Yes. Long story short, right? <laughs> okay. So, there's a copy for each of us. We have a few pending. Here you go. Frank and John. Um, so, there's a pending uh, application from Troy and Kelly Zervesky's at 30 Red Barn Road. Um, they had uh, incorrect advertisement and they said it was from an old listing. They rented it a few years ago. It is outdated. Mm -hmm does not reflect the property in its current updated state. Also, that calendar is blocked off and no res reservations are being accepted. We will update the listing once approved by the town in anticipation of the spring and summer 2022 rentals. Okay. So have they updated and we're fine? Or they want to no. update after we approve? Yes. No, and that's not how the order of things works. No. So um, we'll reach out to them and yeah. explain yeah. how it works on that. Exactly. All right, so this will be remaining pending. Um, and Julie, I'll Actually, work with yeah, you. They, well, they should be denied because they didn't, they didn't, meet, them they didn't meet the requirements. <clears throat> okay, they so we be. are not, we are denying their application because they did not change their Motion. reservation. Motion? Yes, I will take a motion to make deny. A, I will make a motion to not approve okay. the Troy Kelly's the various 30 Red Barn Road. I'll second. All in favor? Aye. 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 All right. The next is for 58 Dana Place Road Realty Trust at 25 Dana Place Road. And they have updated their bedrooms to uh, three bedroom sleeps, eight max. And this is okay to approve. So I will take a motion for that. Make a motion to be approved. The uh, 58 Dana Place Road Realty Trust. Steve. Aye. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 The le next two are both still pending, so Carter Nutchin is still doing some research on the yeah, right. legalities and semantics of remaining an inn and having a short-term rental. And Big Pen is in contact with Kevin Bennett on egress windows. So we will keep those on the agenda for pending. Um, as far as complaints, I reached out to both the Horgans again and heard back from them, and they have changed their advertisement um, and their video on VRBO. So we're okay with that complaint from for now. We will keep an eye on it. But I appreciate them responding to me and changing their video ad. So that is resolved. There are approved building permits, about uh, nine Eight. of them if I think. Correct. And Kevin, are there any issues on the building permits? No, they're all pretty straightforward. Eight of them, sorry. And um, the last one on there is the new roof for the handicap ramp at the office. And hopefully that will be done in the next week, which will be a great improvement once the snow starts to come. So, um, Snow's coming next week? No. <laughs> that was wrong. Scared to change things yeah. up. You never know, actually. Yeah. 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 What are we going to do? Cold. Okay. So, <laughs> upcoming meetings. Tuesday, August 10th at 3.30, which will be held in here live with masks. No Zoom. And the next meeting after that is Tuesday, August 24th at 3.30 p.m. Also in the town building, no masks, I mean, masks required. <laughs> Sorry. Um, any public comments? All right. Well, well, right just oh, check. Frank. Yeah, just um, I've been thinking about what the, the earlier decision you made, of course. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> if I could. Yes. Um, and 
it seems to me that um, my attorney has laid out his arguments, their attorney has laid out their arguments. I'm not sure what having the attorneys come back and make the arguments again is going to serve, you know, unless there's something that Peter doesn't understand in their letters. Um, but you know, I'm just suggesting that perhaps, you know, if, uh, if Peter says, if Peter can adequately explain what he's thinking, uh, why do we need more attorneys to uh, further muddy the water. Yeah, I appreciate that comment. We will reach out to Peter and see if he can Thank give you. us a more understandable um, judgment on what he offered there. And if, if, if Peter has questions, he can certainly maybe on your behalf ask the attorneys right. for clarification. I just right. like to ask a question. That, did you explore, someone told me that you explored maybe trying to go a different road instead of going through the middle of common land that there was something that you go along the edge and perhaps get to the road that you wanted to, is that, what happened to that idea or is that just something that someone made up? Without giving you a lot of detail, the, uh, yeah. there is an old road that goes from the top of my driveway to Beach Hill Road, but it's on the property of Mr. Lukowitz okay. and my homeowners association came to the conclusion that was the best solution to this problem, but of course, they were, um, he's, he is and she is unwilling to grant an easement. Um, mm -hmm. The current proposed route to the driveway uh, is slightly downhill from that road uh, across my land and the land of the Ellis River Village Association to the Chill Road. Um, Jay laid flagged it as following pretty much following the same elevation. So it, it gets to be about 25 or 30, 25 to 50 feet uh, from Mr. Lukic's property. Um, uh, and I, you know, so I, I'm not sure what you're referring to. Um, I, it, it would be possible to build the driveway at greater expense um, closer to his road, but it's much steeper there we'd have to take down far more trees and everything to do that. So this is, this route is the one that kind of follows the shelf of land, doesn't change elevation, and goes cross grade where the slope is less than, is, is less, probably more than you wanted yeah. to answer the question. Right. Well, I thought that the idea was to avoid going through common land because that's, that's what the, the road is. Well, there's, there's, there's no way for me to reach Beach Hill Road other than through yeah, the Hills River yeah. common land. Yeah. It's a common land yeah. association yeah. common land or just property. But I'm sympathetic to you wanting to have a safer way to get out onto a road rather than being on 16. Well, the way up in 16. I, I understand that too. I so. can show you the picture Some two tool cars. Yeah. And all sorts of stuff. So, but, Give us a little more time on this, as Barbara mentioned. We want to yeah. speak to the attorneys just to, you know, understandable and just but to make sure we get this right. I, I, I want that of course, and I'm, I'm just uh, suggesting that uh, you know, the attorneys have told well, Peter everything. And we try to avoid using our attorneys if we can, yeah. maybe to save taxpayer money. If we do. It. Yeah. Well, okay, you, but this is, you know, what I'd like to avoid is. Me and Jim spending even more money. Yeah. You know, <laughs> to I help agree. you reach a conclusion. No. I don't, I don't think they have you to tell you. Okay. Right. Thank you. All right. Thanks, Frank. Oh, you're great. Oh, look at that. Oh, look at that. that. <laughs> this is my. Faster than Amazon. This is my email yeah. address. I'm Lord Carly Bush. Thank you. Wow. 541 miles All from right. the state. Any other public comments? Thank you all for attending. Um, I. We'll take a motion to go into non-public session, oh, which will take a really short time, I promise. I'll make a motion to a non-public session, RSA 91A32E. Dash C. Dash C. No, 32C. 32C. Yes. Not radio. Okay. Um, so thank you all.